Hello, wrestling fans, and welcome back to another edition of NBC's 10 Count. I'm Steve Fall. But on today's edition, I am talking to Brian Gewertz. How are you doing today? Good, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And you know what's funny is the reason I say your name like that is because I listen to too many Bruce Pritchard podcasts where yeah. he obsessively says your last name wrong. He has put your name in this chamber of pronouncing it wrong. So everyone who probably talks to you is like, Gewertz? And I had to do the same thing before we started because it's embarrassing. Nobody wants to call you ye words. But thanks for being here. Well, not only does he do it on the podcast, but he took, you know, back in our day when people would leave uh, voice message, voicemail, you know, outros. Um, you know, in WWE, it was just like, leave your name and then it would be the voice message you have for. And then whenever anyone would call me, it would be Bruce saying, Brian, ye words. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh, my God. That reminds me of like back in the day when you'd call 1-800-COLLECT and you didn't want to pay for the actual call. So you'd say your message really fast into yeah. the beep, you know, uh, come pick me up, dad, I'm the mall. And then you'd hope yeah. your dad heard that. But uh, again, thanks for being here because there's so much to talk about with you. First, behind me, this lovely book. There's just one problem. What inspired you to write this book? Because first off, I have seen and read many wrestling books and Mick Foley would be the first one I read as a kid and I absolutely couldn't put it down. And as years have gone on, you read wrestling books and it kind of becomes this same method of start from the beginning. Let's get to where we are now. This book feels like it's not like that at all. So what inspired you to even write this book? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. Um you know, I don't really consider myself a particularly um, interesting person or <laughs> a fascinating person at all. All right, but interview's over then. All right, uh, we're done here. But the exception is, and I was just talking about this, like the exception is um, when I talk about wrestling stories mm. and it, and in the wrestling environment. Um, actually, it's funny. I was just at Monday Night Raw in, in Brooklyn um, the, a couple days ago. I went with uh, Uli, who plays... 23 year old Dwayne on young rock. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he couldn't believe it because it was like, every, I went backstage and like, it, this is literally the only environment where this happens both in a ring and outside the ring and anywhere where like, we couldn't even, you know, we were heading into our, our seats and then, Oh, there's Miz and Maurice. And Oh, there's Kasama, this, our stage manager for you know years. And Oh, there's this person and that person. And he's like, Oh my God, I never, I never knew you were so popular before. <laughs> yes, only in this very, very specific, very singular circumstance backstage at the WWE locker room, uh, you know, corridor where, you know, you were there for 16 years. So, you know, that's going to if you're not popular there, then, uh, you know, you really you're, you have no luck anywhere. So, yeah, I, I, you know, you have these bank of experiences and stories and you know, you've told you tell them to people over the years and, you know, it's almost like crafting a stand up routine. It's like, yeah, this is this is my over material <laughs> and this is, uh, what people have always responded to and not so much this one, but these ones. So, you know, when the pandemic kind of hit in 2020, um, like that was the opportunity to do a lot of a lot of downtime and a lot of self-reflection. You know, we're all still working from home, but, you know, my job at seven bucks is you know, SVP of development and creating and selling and pitching TV shows, you know, it didn't entirely go away, but things slowed down certainly for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially on weekends, where even if I wasn't going out in New York, uh, where I live on a regular basis anyway, at the very least, I'd be watching a Knicks or, or Mets game or something like that. Yeah. So now I like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Like, like, start, you know, interacting with people on zoom or on the telephone or and people or, making bread everyone was obsessed yeah. with making bread exactly like and, and it was like you know i remember going out like we all did for like an hour at a time putting on the gloves and the masks and oh, yeah. oh my god it's like the 1985 cabbage patch kid phrase like, <laughs> phase like oh my th this secret drugstore has uh lysol wipes you oh, know yeah. like that was like a whole thing and so it was like, you know what, maybe this is the time. That's a long way of going um, through the year 2020 to say, maybe this is the time to actually sit down and put these stories to paper and actually start like um, collecting a series of uh, stories and chapters. Because I know 
I'm not necessarily self-aware about everything, but I am self-aware enough to know that nobody gives a crap about reading like the first 40 pages of then, then I grew up and then I went to Nassau Coliseum. You know, it's like they want to get into the good stuff. Yes. And if I know anything from writing a WWE show, it's like you want to hook the audience uh, from the beginning. And, you know, hopefully once they're hooked and invested and into the story, then maybe they'll sit back and, you know, give you enough of their time to actually read about the you know, and I don't really get into it much, but at least as it relates to my fandom in WWE, you know, the childhood years and going at Nassau Coliseum and MSG and watching Piper and all that type of thing. So, yeah. you know, that was, um, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I always had it in the back of my mind, but never actually applied it and did it. And, you know, when that time struck in 2020 under horrific circumstances, mm. you know, the uh, silver lining of it from a, you know, from a personal standpoint was being able to finally sit down and get this thing underway. Wow. And again, nobody has said a bad word about it. That's even MJF, the man who says nothing good about anyone, said he loves his book. You know, that's that's got to feel good, too, because. They don't have to go on Twitter or anywhere and say they like your book. They don't have to, unless you're paying them. Unless you, no. can, pay, you can pay me, no. and I'll say also <laughs> great things too. It's the best book in the world. Uh, but it's in, it's very interesting that these wrestlers are going out of their way to tweet or or go on social media or anywhere and saying how great this book is. Like, how does that make you feel to know that what you thought was your best stand up routine is your best stand up routine? It's it's really gratifying and humbling at the same time. It's really, really cool to see because, yeah, I don't I don't wield the pencil anymore at WWE. So there's really no reason, you know, a, a very, very hard cynic could be like, well, they're just saying that because then The Rock will hire them to become a tele. Like, that's not how it works. Exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> praise, you know, my book. And then all of a sudden, you know, have a 13 episode sitcom on uh, NBC or a plum roll in a movie. You know, people <laughs> are doing it because they genuinely like it. And, you know, being back the backstage at WWE um, for Raw this month was the first time I'd been backstage uh, since the book came out. Wow. So, yeah. So I, there's so many people stop just to tell me how much they liked it and they read it. And I knew people backstage at WWE would because there's a there's sort of like a lived in ex shared experience. Like even if you weren't on the writing, excuse me, weren't on the writing team, there's still that like, oh, yeah, I remember I know what you're talking about. Right. You know, and the dynamic of a live show and all the things that can go wrong and all the things that can go right. And, um, you know, th that was really, really satisfying. But I absolutely love it. I mean, because there are people that, you know, I've been, you know, I sent some books to saying, hey, I think you'll like this. Let me let me know what you think. And, I'll, and, and they put it over people that I asked for blurbs. And then all of a sudden, like for me, like Liv Morgan, for instance, who I've never formally met. Um, I never actually, you know, even when I was backstage at a show, you know, she was putting her match together. I don't want to interrupt or anything like that. Yeah. You know, it was, was tweeted about, you know, why, reading the book on her way to the UK um, and, and loving it. And like that was that was so cool. It's so cool to see and so satisfying and gratifying. Um, I'm just kind of overwhelmed by it. It's awesome. Well, I think wrestling fans love history too and that, i think that was one mistake i think a lot of people at least it felt like when growing up you feel like oh no no wrestling films won't remember that we'll just do something over here like edge and christian i don't know how involved with you were with, with beyond what they were brothers and then they weren't brothers well everyone remembered they were brothers and suddenly yeah. on tv they weren't brothers and everyone's like mm, come on we remember that so it must be gratifying to know that like live morgan a pretty prominent new character on tv getting a huge push with ronda rousey and all these good moments is going out of her way to read your book to find you and be like, hey, I really enjoyed your book because she doesn't probably need to know those stories, but she wants to know those stories. So again, that must feel pretty good to know that the the newer generation of wrestlers that you were involved with appreciate your work as well. Yeah, there's a sad, horrifying truth to uh, the matter of what's going on, and that is the stuff that I wrote for you know in the early two thousands. Um, that doesn't seem long ago in my head is like the childhood memories of the current <laughs> of wrestlers. It, it's kind of crazy to like, oh, I was a little kid when I saw the first five second pose. Like, well, how is that possible? Because we only did that. Oh, wait a second. Oh, we did was, 22 was... years ago. Yeah. And you're about 26. <laughs> yeah. Now the math is adding up. That's correct. Yes. Oh my God, what has happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, sir. there there is that aspect of it, but it is, yeah, it, you know, it's true. I mean, like I'm the same way. Um, I remember stuff, 
you know, I, I, I'd go, I remember going up to Howard Finkel, uh, the late, great Howard Finkel, you know, when I working at WWE another big Mets fan like me and just saying, you know what, Howard, not for nothing, but like one of the most gratifying thing, one of the most, I've never smiled more as a fan when you'd introduce Lanny Poffo as the genius and he'd get into the ring and he'd whisper in your ear and then you'd have this like eye roll and sigh and be like, ladies and gentlemen, I've just been informed the genius <laughs> of the one for us all. And, you know, you just, it sticks with you, you know, yeah. the stuff of your childhood, it just sticks with you forever. So uh, it's really cool to see, um, you know, people responding to the book and people reliving really their own wrestling memories too, you know, even in just in general, just in life. I just love that stuff. Well, it's funny because I like, I collect every WWF WWE magazine and I'm like, oh man, I have so many. There's so many. When did it stop? It stopped in 2013. Yeah. We're, 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 we're rolling into 2023. Like it made me like my, my group, my beard turned gray instantly when I realized that, oh my God, what's going on? I had to get my just for, just for men out and take care of that instantly. But it was insane. Like I have a rock. I have the rock right here on the cover of TV nice. guide. T yeah. guide. Before you had no idea when things were on TV, you had to open this little book and go, oh, that went on. Oh, this is on. No. Now you just go into your, into your phone or into your remote. It's like the weirdest thing is how things have changed, but yet some of it still feels the same. Like wrestling still exists, still doing its thing. And, but yet the landscape of the WWE certainly has changed with Triple H now in the seat that Vince McMahon sat in forever. He must be, the ass groove must be insane in that chair. But yet, what do you think of that? Because you obviously worked with Vince McMahon for so long, 15 years plus, and yet he's out. Like, did you ever think there'd be a WWE without Vince McMahon? Uh, no, and nobody did. No. Nobody ever could have imagined. Like, you know, Vince himself would would joke like, you know, you know, even even when I die, my brain's going to be in, you know, <laughs> inserted into a, something and be running the show. Um, you know, it's, you know, Vince is synonymous with WWE. Um, but I know Triple H, it's not like, you know, Triple H just got like, you know, plucked from the audience of The Price is Right and was like, you know, all of a sudden, congratulations, you're now yeah. in charge. You know, Triple H, not only, you know, Paul Avec not only was, you know, a performer and executive and everything else before then, but even in his prime, when he was a wrestler and I, again, I started at WWE in um, November of 99 and he was, you know, at the time, the only wrestler uh, who would still sit in the production meetings and not just for his stuff, but like want to weigh in on everything. And in there, I think to want to absorb everything. This was before he was, you know, married to and or dating Stephanie. This is like, just because he loves the business. Mm. He loves every aspect of the business. And it's, you know, it's, there couldn't be, you know, between Triple H and Stephanie and Nick Khan on the business side of things. I, I mean, I think that's a really, really strong triumvirate and leadership um, that is, that is, you know, everyone was at first, you know, always theories of like, you know, when Vince is no longer running the show, is it going to turn into, you know, late 1999 WCW when, you know, there were many different, you know, leaders and nobody really knew who was in charge. And it was kind of like a inmates running the asylum type of thing. Uh, no, like, like the structure is there. The leadership is there. The passion is there for sure. Um, and now you're, you know, you're seeing it, you know, you're seeing it on screen. I think like, I don't think the show is completely morphed to the point of like, it's unrecognizable from the Vince McMahon era, but you could definitely see changes and, you know, some subtle, some not. Um, and they'll find their footing. You know, it's like every show has a different element to that. It, it seems like every segment and every um, episode, you know, has something, you know, a, a very um, deliberate effort to make something happen that people were not expecting, uh, whether it's a return, whether it's a storyline angle or something is going on that like, you know, I don't want to say certain episodes ran on autopilot, but it felt that way sometimes watching, you know, months ago, years ago, what have you, where, you know, a match that, in my opinion, would have no business expanding beyond one segment and going into two segments um, would happen just because, you know, well, let's get some action on the show. Like now it seems like, you know, that is that is changing and changing for the better. 
Now, here's a question for you I think a lot of people want to know because it seems that the new way Triple H is doing things is like, hey, you go out there. Obviously, we want you to do something. We want you to do a certain uh, segment or say something to get over whatever you're doing. But yet, it felt like for years, and I've interviewed so many wrestlers, and I've asked the same question, like, you got, we use the term, you got over, you know, you suddenly the crowd loved you because of whatever you were doing. It was not suddenly a design for this to happen, but it felt like everyone who suddenly got over on their own was punished. And, I, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and they all feel the same way. They were punished because they did something, and they did it without the consent of the company. Now, obviously, you were writing for so long. Was that ever the case of you're writing something for someone? You obviously want this person, you know, we'll call him Wrestler A, to be the popular wrestler here. But Wrestler B suddenly is doing its own thing saying its own random catchphrases or winking at the camera or whatever and that's suddenly going over the crowd loves that but they don't want b to be over they want a to be over is that something that was discussed ever because it seems like fans feel like it's changed with triple h now in charge well look i could say this just from my perspective um and, and because we're in october I'll, I'll use the and probably soon to be uh poor analogy of a halloween candy bag okay uh, you want that bag filled and filled with as many different candy as possible. And when you find like, you know, when, when an act is over, when a wrestler is over, that's just another, you know, <laughs> in this horrible analogy, piece of candy in your bag that you can now enjoy and savor. Like I loved it when people got over, when Miz and Morrison went off to do the dirt sheet, you know, their yep. uh, dot com thing with, you know, pretty much on their own with maybe one, you know, also just starting out WWE writer and not with a quote unquote office behind it. Mm. Uh, great. You know, when Zack Ryder was doing his, you know, Long Island Ice Z story yep. on YouTube, I thought it was awesome. You know, and now I don't I can't I can only speak for myself, but I don't think, I mean, in general, there's a lot of like, you know, dynamics and a lot of cogs in the machine and what have you. But I never thought it was a like if you can get yourself over. I love having characters that are over when I'm writing a show because it makes the show better and it makes every segment better. So please get yourself over in any means necessary. Um, and I will not hold that against you. I certainly didn't. Um, you know, and now sometimes, you know, if like, I don't know, if, if Vince, you know, wasn't feeling Zack Ryder at a certain point or in an episode, um, you know, I just think that that has to do with whatever Vince's personal you know, opinion is of the character. I don't think it was the, how dare he use YouTube to get himself over. Of course not. Yeah. When it wasn't the machine that got him over, therefore he's going to be punished. I never saw that. I never experienced that. If that was what was being felt by some people, uh, that was never expressed to me, nor did I, you know, feel it myself. Right. And I think with any job, though, you don't go tell your manager all your complaints and feelings, because mm -hmm. if you do, you're looked at as a complainer or someone who's writing somebody out. Well, why is so and so getting a, 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 a brand new position here and I'm stuck over here doing my old job? Like, obviously, no one's going to go to everybody and complain. And that's, I think, what's happening now, at least from the perspective of the online you know, wrestling community where they believe that finally, and I don't know if I have no idea. It just seems like this the perception is, is it's, it's like suddenly the sun's out. Like Vince McMahon was a cloud and suddenly Triple H is the sun and he's bringing all this rainbows. And I have highly doubt that's true because obviously for the years and years of Vince putting in, it wasn't like Vince was like, you know what we should do? Let's put on a bad show and piss off some fans. Like I highly doubt ever he was thinking that, but a one man perspective of a program when you have a vast, audience of different personalities watching a show you know you always heard the buck stops at one person vince mcmahon do you feel like maybe triple h has an open ear policy versus vince mcmahon no i don't, I've never worked with vince so these are yeah. just like things you see and read and, and wonder and pile facts together where vince mcmahon was like that sounds great but we're gonna do it my way i think it's you know i think it's basically a new person in charge with different tastes and a different perception of how the business should be presented um i think that's why you're seeing all these people come back you know, there are people that were released. I know just watching as a fan that at the time I thought, what are they, nuts? These are great talents. What are they doing releasing them? Uh, and now you're seeing some of them come back. You know, to me, it would have been, I, I don't care, you know, I, and all I know is internet rumors as well nowadays, right. but I don't know how much money Bray Wyatt's making. I don't know, you know, blah, 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 back in the day when he was the fiend, Bray Wyatt. But to release, like, that is you know, again, to use the horrible Halloween bag, that is your giant Snickers bar in Bray Wyatt. 
That's not like a little fun size piece. That is a full grown piece. Um, the guy's so talented and so dynamic that, you know, for me to see him gone was nuts. I know, you know, in different presentations, see like, um, you know, carrying cross and Scarlet and everything, like not even being paired together when he first came into WWE. Uh, now you see, you know, that they are, that's in Triple H's vision in terms of how they're being presented right now. And a lot of the NXT talent, the ones who came back as well, and Bailey's group and everything else. Um, it's just like a different person now in charge with a different, you know, view of the business. Um, certainly learning all the things that he's learned from Vince and, you know, Paul has, but also having his own opinion and having his own idea. And maybe, I don't know, maybe the dynamic, you know, is different with with Paul and the writers as well as being, you know, more... I wouldn't say Vince wasn't inclusive. He'd heard he'd hear everyone's ideas and always be open for a good idea. He was famous for that. Um, but at the end of the day, too, you know, when you're living as a living legend for so long, for for so many decades, uh, at a certain point, you're like, well, we're doing this my way. But everyone's, you know, responding to this. Well, we're still doing this my way. Um, and 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 that dynamic, I think, has changed. And it's like another person, um, you know, at the helm. That's always going to result in a different show, um, no matter what. And, um, you know, I, I think most of the presentations that are being, you know, brought back and repackaged and what have you um, are interesting and being, you know, utilized correctly or at least given a chance to be correctly. Because some of the people who at first came up, you know, and they were like, I don't care what they did in NXT, we're doing it this way now, you know, was unfortunately dead on arrival. And now, you know, you're seeing... Well, I don't know if they're going to get over or not. I don't know if, you know, Johnny Gargano is going to get over. Um, you know, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Will, but he's definitely given every opportunity. He's given mic time. He's given match time. He's in a, you know, a storyline with Austin Theory and everything. Let's see what happens. It's great. It's like not like, uh, oh, boy, this person, has no, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. Yes. I'm so glad you said that because, yeah, as a fan, obviously yourself, you you – have watched enough to realize you can't be one character on one show and appear in another as a different and accept and hope everyone's like, yeah, this person's great over here. Like, why is Karen Cross wearing a a, a Farouk uh, helmet? Why is he dressed up like Farouk Fassad? Why is this happening? But yes, it, it it's, it's good to see what's happening now. But obviously you are the senior vice president of creative development for Seven Bucks Production. And that involves The Rock. And everyone wants to know the question to this. Everyone wants to know the answer to this question. Is The Rock going to take back his table against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 2023? It's just me and you talking. If you know the details, just tell me. I won't tell anybody else. It's right here. Uh, yeah, no, I have no idea. And I really don't. This is, you know, all I know is if, when, if and when Rock, Dwayne, you know, comes back to WWE, um, you know, the bar he always sets, and I wrote about it in the book, and you see it, you know, in all his projects and Black Adam, which I just had a screening for, it's like the expectation level is so high and this audience first mentality that is very, very real, it needs to match it. And it needs to be something gigantic and something not just like, oh, that's a nice attraction that, oh, that's a main event in any arena across the country kind of thing, yeah. but like truly meaningful, impactful, you know, ground shaking you know paradigm shifting gigantic you know and and you know whether or not that you know manifests itself in a wrestlemania main event um you know the fan of me would love to see it if it's the right circumstance and everything but you know i don't know he's got he certainly has a lot of stuff going on between you know this gigantic movie coming out in october um our tales from the territory show now i'm going to get all these <laughs> projects I, they're all right here you yeah. let me get to him and we'll talk Young about Rock. him. And plus in February, um, oh, by, oh, he's not doing anything in February. I saw like an internet report at one point saying, oh, The Rock's not shooting any movies in February. Like, uh, no, I don't know if he is or not, but he is launching, you know, with Danny, a gigantic football league. So that might take some time too, because, you know, Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, Hiram Garcia, like no one at seven bucks is of the ilk of, um, all right, stamp my name on it. Is, they're not we're not crusty the clown it's like yeah put our logo on it and our face on it and let me know how it does you know oh what god does. yeah please god don't do that uh, we don't yeah. want we don't want crusty burgers with the rock's face on them with like yeah. what is this, is this meat is this meat inside this i, I 
I'll, I'll eat. I'll eat it. It has the rock's face on it. The tank top <laughs> hardest worker in the room is, um, you know, is not just a catchphrase. It's it's a company wide ethos. So, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, whatever happens, it will happen for a reason. All right. So the headlines say you lied and you know everything, and you're just you're just holding back. That's what the headlines are going to say. Okay, just I'm the warning. That's fine. You. <laughs> they, they can see it. I honestly don't know. Um, but you brought up some of your projects. Let's talk about it. November 5th, Young Rock returns on NBC. And I'm so pumped because I absolutely love this show because I did read, you know, the the Rock's book that came out, like, I think it was 1999. And it was maybe 2000. And it was so weird because I was like, it felt like for me as a, as a kid, that's right, I was a kid. And I'm like, he's only been wrestling in the WWF for, you know, three, four years. What the hell is this book going to be about? Obviously, it was about so much more. But yet, Young Rock, third season. If people have probably been searching the Rock's information for so long, they want they want to know every inch of it. Are we going to see like twists and turns in the season that maybe we don't know of the Rock's life? I would say yes. I'd say the answer to that is yes because you know traditionally every year before the season starts, it's Rock, it's myself, it's Hiram Garcia, it's uh, our produ- our producing partners and co creators, Nanachka Khan, um, Jeff Chang, Jen Carreras. We're sitting down. And it's essentially this big Q&A session where we're asking Dwayne for stories. And I, you know, go into these things going, well, I know every story. And I don't. And there is a major story and a major story that's going to unfold this season that involved his parents and his grandparents that I, I, I'm sorry, his grandmother and his uh, parents that I had no idea about. And nobody in the room did. We're all like, what? That happened? He's like, that absolutely happened. And that's like serving as the major storyline for that era in 1985 and that season. So yeah, there, there are definitely going to be surprises from from that perspective. And also just like, you know, the fan in me just loves the surprises of who's showing up this year. You know, which wrestler is going to, um, you know, appear that hasn't appeared in a previous season. And I'll just say that there are some major gigantic names in the world of uh, WWE, both from the 80s and 90s, that have yet to appear on Young Rock in seasons one and two, who are absolutely appearing in season three. Oh my God. Like, uh, yeah. oh, you, you, again, you can tell me if you want it. I won't tell anybody, but that's amazing. Because again, Young Rock season one and two, so exciting, so much fun. And I love the when we would go to the past and then come to the present. And like at one point, The Rock's on a campaign. We're like, not sure what he's doing. I, I love it so much. But the third season, are we going to see more development of, you know, in the future, The Rock's running for president on these, on these seasons? Or is that just like a. Everyone wants The Rock to be president, but it won't ever happen except in uh, on a TV show. No, well, the end of season two, he lost the election. Yeah, and you know, and I know it might be, you know, foreign to hear in in twenty twenty two, but like he loses the election and accepts the end of the election <laughs> results as factual. So it's not. It's not gonna. He's gonna do the same thing we've seen in the news cycle. He's yeah. gonna steal he's documents. Gonna the results. Um, it's a, so it's the next chapter, you know, we were in 2032, I think in seasons one and two, yeah. we're, uh, in 2033 and he's not the president of the United States of America. Um, but he's there and Randall Park is there and a whole new, uh, storyline emerges. So it's very cool. And it's also cool, you know, for us, for him not to be president in this era, because a, we don't want to turn the show into veep. You know, you can't do better than Veep. I mean, Veep is one of the best shows of all time. Um, but also, you know, it, it allows us to have, you know, Rock, DJ, um, be a little looser now, a little more, you know, be a little bit more of himself. You know, the Rock you see on his Instagram and, and in interviews and everything else, he doesn't have to be, you know, on his best behavior because he's running for president on the show. Um, he's a civilian now. So, you know, there's um, there's a lot of fun in that dynamic, uh, as you'll see in the uh, premiere and, uh, you know, going forward as well. Well, I can't wait. But Tales from the Territories premiered on Vice October 4th. Now, what was the inspiration behind this program? Because there was a program and it might still exist. I, I think they're bringing, getting ready to do their new season, Dark Side of the Ring. And you see Tales from the Territories and you're like, oh, like another version of this is that what this really is to you or is this a whole different ball game and we're talking about a whole different set of circumstances 
it's kind of a combination of both because you know both both rock and myself you know as wrestling fans and you know just passionate about it you know like we like dark side of the ring um you know found those episodes to be really interesting obviously very dark as as mentioned you know by its name um a lot of tragedy um but also you know Dwayne, as we explore on young rock you know he lived through the territory system he you know that was kind of the the impetus at first for young rock because every time we'd get together in wwe and start working on a promo and it's like ah oh, what could we do what is, well what what's this city i grew up in this city like wait <laughs> what like you were but i thought you were in this city like yeah i was there too like he moved all over the country with his dad as his dad was you know going from territory to territory um and so i know that he had posted about dark side of the ring on his instagram without having any you know official affiliation with it just as a fan of the show yeah. um and we had at seven bucks we had a, a general meeting um with evan husney and jason eisner who were the creators of the show and it was one of those things where you know Dwayne had said to me like yeah see what can come out of that maybe there's something you know in the space of wrestling history that's just more fun and crazy and wild you know the stories that he grew up with and that i had heard you know when i was in a wwe locker room with from guys like michael hayes and arn anderson and and jerry briscoe pat patterson jack lanza um like what can what can we do to uh, kind of bring that to light and it just so happened that evan and jason had been thinking along those same lines and you know we got together we also worked with chavo guerrero who's our wrestling coordinator on uh, young rock and just started brainstorming and ultimately came up with this idea of like, we don't need to show the dark side. Some there'll be some overlap sometimes, right. but we can, you know, at least every episode, a different territory, except for Memphis, which was just so gigantic and had the whole uh, Jerry Lawler, Andy Kaufman angle that we made that its own episode in and of itself. But we can take an episode in Stampede and Calgary and take, you know, world-class in Texas and Florida and Portland and mid-south and mid-atlantic and ppw in uh, hawaii and tell get these legends together put them at a table do the same dark side when i say it's kind of like you know a crossover combo it is you know we're working with the dark side creators and they're still shooting their reenactments and their uh, reimaginings of these stories you know in that same style of, of dark side with like you know the uh you know the, the very stylized specific stylized way that they shoot their recreations um so yeah there, there's a part of that but it's really like let's just go wild here and tell the stories that you know you don't necessarily hear on cable broadcast you know really you don't hear these stories anywhere except for like some shoot interviews on youtube and books and even then they're not like stylized like this where you actually see the stories unfold so that was yeah that was a great um it, it was a great um shared vision by everybody to be able to uh, tell the wild, crazy, just absolutely awesome uh, stories from the territory days. Well, I absolutely love Andy Kaufman, no matter what. So the idea, you know, like you think of the later in years, like a Tom Green, where he, they would go out and try to re get you the real people to have real reactions to what's happening because he's an actor trying to get you to react. And the same thing, Andy Kaufman with Jerry Lawler, people believed what was happening. And I think telling that story again, because we have Man in the Moon, the movie, but yet, like, that's a movie. So we're all underneath the, uh, uh, like, oh, is this Hollywood, you know, spicing it up? No. Yeah. Like, everything you saw, it seemed to be real. So, like, that episode to me really spoke because I love Annie Kaufman. I love Jerry Lawler. So, actually, my daughter. Oh, I was going to say, my daughter moved my toy. There he is. My little oh, little nice. Get a little, right, put him right back there. That's a little birthday present I got. There we go. But, uh, yeah, absolutely love the show. But let's talk about wrestling for one second one more time. 15 years from now, since you worked in the business for 15 years, let's move 15 years from now. Where do you see the wrestling business? Are we going to still have the WWE and AEW and Impact, NWA, New Japan, AAA? Like some of these organizations have been running for a long time. Some are babies. So like, where do you see everything going in 15 years? I mean, honestly, I have no idea. But I, I do think the WWE... I mean, I can't speak for AEW just because I don't know, you know, I know a lot of the individual talents who work there, but I don't know, you know, the um, the infrastructure or anything like that. Um, but, you know, WWE w has been essentially, you know, doing what they've been doing on primetime, you know, since 1993. 
Um, and they were certainly, you know, in terms of syndication and primetime wrestling and, you know, the Saturday morning shows before that, you know, they, they have a pretty solid foundation in place. You know, I don't know what the world's going to look like in 15 years from now, but if I were a betting man, I would say WWE is still uh, alive, well, thriving. You know, I, I couldn't predict, you know, maybe Vince could have predicted uh, because he always had WWE Network, you know, in mind. But, you know, who would have thought like streaming platform like they're doing what? Why, right. why, why not be on cable next to the Golf Channel? That's what you're supposed to do next to the Golf and Tennis Channel. That's the future, damn it. <laughs> you know, and then they're streaming. But then just when you think they're streaming, they're, you know, you know, absorbed and and, and now like on Peacock. Uh, and who would have thought of what Peacock would have been, you know, five years ago? Um, yeah. I don't know what the landscape of the world was going to be, you know, 15 years, but I have enough faith and confidence in, you know, WWE, AEW too. I mean, they're, they're top 10 in cable every single week, um, you know, ratings ebb and flow and what have you. But I know a lot of shows and a lot of shows that I've worked on, a lot of shows that, uh, you know, my friends work on uh, that would, that would definitely love to have AEW's numbers on a weekly basis. Um, so I, I would think that, um, you know, I think the fan base and the appetite for it, for sports entertainment, for wrestling, for whatever you want to call it, um, is generational. And, and you know, it, it gets passed down and people discover it. People grow out of it. Some people don't. Um, but I think it's always going to be there because at the end of the day, it's good versus evil. It's storytelling. And that's been around, you know, since the beginning of time. Yeah. And, you know, that's it's, it's really, you know, just a very basic good versus evil physicality i want to see this person kick this other person's ass and i don't think that's certainly not going away in a decade and a half in my opinion so i don't know what the platform is going to look like and what the you know the presentation and oh well you've got to uh you know scan the i was just gonna say i can track your beam in your head you can see it like oh you don't see this match inside my brain yeah, and it gets just downloaded and we're just in Rick and Morty land and stuff. But yeah. um, but it will definitely, in my opinion, you know, definitely exist and be, uh, you know, an entity that people still enjoy. Of course. And obviously, I think just like how you brought up the WWE has such a, a, a foundation. It's like, you know, you have so many organizations that are associated with a brand, but yet they're not that. They're not the actual like NFL football, you know what I mean? You think of MLB, you think of baseball, NHL, you think you know, tissues, band aids, you know, you think of all these companies that exist that are connected to that. And I think wrestling, WWE, that's that foundation. But you brought up AEW in, in their ratings as well. And, you know, there's so many fans right now who I love on Twitter, they're like, you wouldn't have survived in the Monday Night Wars. Like the anger that each side gets on Twitter because they're like, each brand was talking about each other on TV on a weekly basis. You wouldn't have been able to survive. And it's like, I don't know, what are you talking about survive? Like it's a TV <laughs> show. We're, we're watching wrestling. We're having fun. But do you ever come upon that? Does anyone ever say to you, like, do you see how ridiculous that some people are getting defending both shows versus like there are so many cop dramas do you think people who are watching both sides of cop dramas are like your show sucks no your show sucks like no mine's better mine have a better cop no i have a better cop like does that is that is wrestling like the only organization that this exists i i don't know i mean there might be I know, like, you know, especially because we have Black Adam coming out, you know, there's a oh, lot of Marvel work. DC, yeah, Marvel DC and comic books, Star Wars, and, Star and, Trek, and, yeah, yeah, all that type of stuff. And, you know, and what's, you know, the is Andor any good or Mandalorian or why, why didn't Boba Fett get off Tatooine and up, you know, all, all that type of thing, yeah, but, um, yeah, like, you know, if you're looking for, you know, moderate, um, you know, civil discourse on the wrestling business, social media and Twitter might not be the best place. Uh, to find that but you know what it's like and I don't even really I, I don't get to catch AEW that much I, I like I like a lot of people nowadays I consume a lot of it on my social media feed you know and, yeah. and watching clips and, and that type of thing um, and, and same with WWE when I was down in Australia shooting Young Rock um, because who knows it was like you know 11 a.m on Tuesday when Monday Night Raw was going on <laughs> nine o'clock on East Coast time on Monday so yeah there's like you know I think I think both companies seem to be doing pretty well um, there. You know, I know if you look at it from the um, the metric of, well, the ratings from, you know, 1999, 2000 or whatever are so much different than the ones today. And that equals, you know, that means this is better than that and that type of thing. It's like, well, 
I don't know. You could debate that. You know, everyone's got their opinion that might be right. That might be wrong. Mm. Um, I just enjoy that they're both on the air and that there are a lot of wrestlers working and yeah. getting to, you know, really execute their creative visions and and do their thing. Uh, and not just in those two companies, but, you know, in, in lots of places uh, with the possibility of, you know, talent jumping to different organizations and that kind of thing. It's just like, you know what, I, I, I really have no, you know, um, stake in the matter in terms of uh, what the inner workings and mechanics and ratings and did this go up in the 25 to 54 demographic and what happened. Like, <laughs> The show's on i'm gonna watch it or i'm not gonna watch it or i'm gonna enjoy right. it or not enjoy it like that's yes. really there's no point in my opinion of like getting so granular and so just into the weeds because there's just a whole you know there's a whole world out there there's um i mean not for me anymore because the mets got eliminated from the playoff but <laughs> oh no people there's like there's lots of there's lots of other things in life <laughs> <laughs> just not just not the Mets. No, just not the Mets. Interesting you bring that up because – Very uh, – I don't know. I see. It's very yeah. sad. The the fact that you brought it up I think is hilarious is like someone would be like, well, in 1999, they did 8 million viewers. Was there YouTube? Was there social media? Was there streaming platforms? No. So there were no other options. If you didn't watch, you missed. If you didn't have your VCR on a timer to record this episode, it would not be seen. You, there were no reruns except for – Nitro that kept doing it over and over and over again, but in today's world, no, you can't compare like a 1950s movie to today's standards. Like it's not possible. You can't do the oh, same oh. thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there were, I think the, I think the number, I think there were 17 people um, in America who knew how to program their VCR back in 1999. <laughs> um, and so I was, it's, I think it's, yeah, I, and I, <laughs> I wasn't one of them. I was in, uh, I was in the other pool. Um, yeah, and between and, and gaming too, by the way, you know, yes. I, I'm so I'm so out of it, you know, like my gaming experience is like every every now and then I'll play my Ms. Pac Man on my iPad. That's the like, I but it's you on know, your iPad though, but it's on your, yeah, I mean, it's not like you're exactly. busting out your your Nintendo from 1985 and, and blowing yeah. in the cartridge and putting it in, and hopefully it works. Well, Steve, I don't know if you know this, but nowadays. You could put on your uh, your Xbox there or your PlayStation and play people who aren't even in the same house as you. Stop the presses! <laughs> is this something? This new? This is yeah. new. This just came out, I think. Oh, yesterday? Oh, yeah, I, I've been busy. I had I had a newborn. I've been busy. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know oh. when that happened, but that's fascinating. Wow. Um, the, yeah, you don't even have to put a quarter on the machine anymore and just kind of fold your arms <laughs> and stare at the person hoping they die. You can actually just play whenever you want and and put on a headset and communicate even it's it's insane but yeah the entertainment options now the whole landscape i mean that's what's going to be crazy in 15 years like, who knows um but yeah it's it's completely you know people could be dismissive and be like uh yeah well that's excuses and the super bowl gets a ton of numbers and yes event programming of course yeah it's gonna get gigantic the most expensive most you know, gigantic things in the world are still going to get gigantic numbers and everything, even though they're not the same as they were even, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but yeah, it's it's across the board. The numbers on primetime television um, that we see both for our network shows and cable shows, um, you know, what's considered a good number now um, would have been, you know, not only canceled 10 years ago, but like, please don't ever come back to the television business. <laughs> Uh, I know. Different. That's I know. I remember uh, watching like you know made for movie about Full House, and they were like they were canceled when they had like oh you only have nine million people watching you every week. Well, that's a failure to us. Yeah. Like, hey, what? Why are we doing so great? We're like top twenty. Yeah. Well, you're a loser to us. Get out of here, <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. You got it, dude. You're out of here. But uh, that's interesting. I, I'm just so happy you brought that up because that's something I think people need, need to realize in wrestling that like it's – even in TV, like ratings are not going to be the same they were when Seinfeld had its last episode in 97 versus when an episode of a show ends in today's era. It's not going to be the same ratings because of all different options. It was like 62 channels. Now they're yeah. like 600 channels. Well, the numbers – yeah, I was – the last um... – the last episode of a, of a network show that I worked on before um, before Young Rock was a sitcom called Jenny on uh, NBC, Jenny McCarthy show uh, in 1997. And we were canceled. I mean, I forget what, I mean, it was a 13 episode order. I think we were canceled around episode nine or 10 or something like that. Um, 
and yeah and, and the number like if if if, if any show it uh produced a a 1997 jenny number nowadays we would be you know like it would be the toast of hollywood <laughs> it would, like all right they they're getting jenny numbers give them whatever they want yes multi-year deal 18 spinoffs you know i was just gonna say the jenny spinoffs we need the yeah. side characters to have their own shows too but uh, again, thank you so much for being here on NBC's 10 Count. I really appreciate you talking about ratings. How about your book? Remember, it's out. There's just one problem. He used to be one of the most powerful men, seventh most powerful men in the world. Now he's no longer anything. No, I'm just kidding. He's still the VP, Senior v Vice President of Creative Control of Seven Bucks Productions. Again, we have so many things to talk about. Tales from the Territories, Season 3 of Young Rock, November 4th. I'm pumped. You're pumped. We're all pumped. Brian Geewertz, thanks for being here. I'm Steve Fall. He's been Brian Geewertz. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.